So that's what I mean by a function-based approach. We're identifying the why. We're identifying the antecedents and the consequences that might be maintaining this behavior over time so that we can change the environment to change the behavior. And this is what I like about ABA most, is it's so optimistic <laughs> that saying that we have control over so much in the environment that if we can only identify the aspects of the environment that are shaping behavior, we can change those aspects of the environment to change the behavior. It's not just within the child. It's within the system and the environment. So the essence is to disrupt, to identify first what's maintaining this behavior, and then to disrupt the relationship between the reinforcer, what's maintaining it, and the behavior itself, while also making sure that you're teaching and strengthening alternative behaviors, more functional behaviors, by and large, communication. <clears throat> so we talk about reinforcement in a few different categories. With our assessments, we identify, is it positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, or is it automatic? Positive reinforcement, we're talking about things in the environment, responses in the environment that are occurring that result in um, gaining things, right? So maybe you're gaining attention or you're gaining access to items or activities, um, like that you get attention, right? Um, or maybe you get access to preferred items or even um, water, anything that's pleasurable. Negative reinforcement is getting out of things that are aversive in some way. But not just, um, people tend to talk about getting out of work as negative reinforcement. That is one example. But there's also, maybe you just want some alone time. You want to get away from social attention. Maybe it's to get out of undesired activities or tasks. Um, high effort activities, uncertain situations, especially if you have autism. And social cues are completely ambiguous and very confusing. Right? You can see how some of that might play in. Um, and, something like, and these things apply to everyone and their learning and their experiences all the time, positive versus negative reinforcement. We have competition between those two types of reinforcement all the time in our experiences. Um, there's, con there's often competition between the two, right? So as I'm agreeing to come do this talk, the positive reinforcer is I get to share what I think is in incredibly cool, important information with the people who are going to really get to affect change. And that's the positive reinforcement that gets me to you know, say, yes, I want to come do this talk. But then as you get closer to the event, you get nervous. You know, what if I mess up? Um, oh, I have all these other like, tasks I need to get done, ASAP. And negative reinforcement gains power as you get closer to that event. And that's a phenomenon that's seen by and large in psychology for all people. So you can think about with kids, too, how that competition between positive and negative reinforcement is important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Automatic. This is um, the reinforcers happening within the body or under the skin, is what behavior analysts say. So in and of itself, the behavior is reinforcing, internally driven. And this is the area um, of ABA that is most nebulous because ABA really likes to talk about things that are directly observable and measurable, but it's really hard to get at the variables that happen under the skin, right? That are actually affecting that individual internally, yet they're still extremely important. And um, there's a lot of new research going on right now looking at this subclass of reinforcers, because it's largely been neglected. So if you want to chat with me about that after, I'd be happy to do that. So to break it down again, um, we have the positive reinforcers, which are tangible and attention. Those are the technical terms that we use to talk about it. Tangibles are access to preferred items or activities, um, and attention is a response from others. And these are just subclasses, just ways of talking about different types of positive reinforcers so that we can get more specific about what kinds of interventions might be most matched to what kinds of functions. Escape, getting out of things that are unpleasant. And automatic, the behavior is reinforcing in and of itself. So like habits often. So I, I, what I say to parents sometimes is, if, this, if the individual would engage in the behavior or does when they're alone in their room, regardless of whether or not people notice or respond, that's likely to be automatic. If it's something that results in access to good things, right, it's either tangible or attention. And if it's getting out of bad stuff, escape. 
So how do we get at this with function-based assessments? And everybody here has heard about FBAs, function-based assessments. But what an FBA means um, is a little bit more nebulous sometimes. So, so sometimes I'll, teachers talk about FBAs all the time, but there's actually a wide variety in what people understand them to be. They fall into these three categories, indirect assessments, direct, and then experimental analyses. And with this visual, we're looking at, as you get closer to the center, increasingly um, valid assessment. Indirect measures, these are like rating scales, screeners, and they're very valuable tools and often a good place to start, but they have limited validity. So if, you, if your FBA consists only of indirect measures and the intervention isn't working that well, there's a good chance you gotta go back to the drawing board and move in closer to that center of a more valid assessment. Direct observation. This is like your ABC assessment. So you're directly observing the child and you're taking notes and looking for patterns and what happens right before the behavior and what happens after. And based on those correlations, you're making assumptions about what might be the cause or the, um, the function there. But that still is just correlation and we know correlation doesn't equal causation. Experimental analysis, this is where you're really getting at testing variables um, and experimental control. And this is the most valid type of assessment we have, but it does require specialized training. So for ABC observations and interviews, this is that direct assessment piece. It's just creating a simple um, note sheet like this in three categories. What happens, what's going on, and then you note if any behaviors happen, any of the target behaviors you're looking for. And then you say, how do people respond? And you notice those patterns. Across, across times, across settings. So this first one, the individual is alone watching TV, and then the individual starts screaming and stomping, and um, this is in a residential context, a group home context, and the staff come in and check on the individual. What might be the function there? Just shout it out. Attention, might be, right? But it could also be anything else, <laughs> and it's just that staff come in when there's a problem, right? It could be anything else. Um, asked to take a shower, the individual engages in aggression, and then the staff says, looks like you need a break, maybe we'll shower today after work, or before bed. What might be the function there? Might be escape, right? but it might also be attention. It might be that the, sta the staff coming and talking about the shower being postponed is the reinforcer in and of itself. Um, and then indirect assessment, the FAST, you can find that online, um, but it has the, it's even less valid, much less valid even than the ABC observation. But it's certainly better than nothing. Here's another example of an ABC data sheet. So a time to get up, screaming, hitting, crying, um, the child doesn't get up and they miss the bus and go to work, right? Um, so it might be related to getting out of work, but it might also just be that they're tired. Um, this next one, they're alone in their room, screaming and hitting walls, staff come in to check on them, and then the person calms down quickly. That last column is often, um, it says other notes there, but sometimes I, I call that effect. So what is the effect of the consequence? because that can help add some clarity to this, right? Because in this first one, staff come in to check on Tom. If Tom calms down right away, that's much more suggestive of attention as the reinforcer. But if Tom continues to be very upset, maybe there's something on the TV that's bothering him, right? Or maybe he doesn't feel good. Maybe there's something hurting him inside. The effect gets at that. Now the gold standard at the center of the most valid assessment is a functional analysis. And with this assessment, um, this is what we refer to, I, I describe it as like an allergy test for behavior. Can you raise your hand if you've ever been involved with a functional analysis? Okay, just a few people. Um, so with this assessment, we are assessing different environmental variables and in presenting them and removing them to see the response in a way that um, is kind of like an allergy test. So 
I was getting hives for a while, and I was just having hives all of the time, like random times, and we, I couldn't see any correlation. So with an allergy test, they can expose you to potential allergens directly, see what you react to, what produces the hives. Say it's mold. They, you, they stick you with mold, you get a hive, and then they can remove the mold, and then does the hive go away? That's essentially what you're doing with a functional analysis. You're presenting a situation where you present demands, maybe, or things that you might guess are aversive to the individual. And then you see when I present this, is that when I see the aggression or the self-injury? And then when I remove the demand in response to the aggression, does the behavior stop? Or the self-injury, whatever it may be. And you kind of do that over and over to see what percentage of times that I present this demand does the child hit themselves in the mouth, right? And do they stop hitting themselves in the mouth when I say, okay, you can take a break? Because essentially that's what we think is happening once in a while, enough to maintain that behavior over time. And we're testing in it on, um, in a controlled setting. Another situation you might look at is you have the teacher ignore the child because you think it might be attention seeking. And then the child burps, let's say, they engage in the target behavior, or let's go back to hitting in the mouth, right? Whatever it may be. And then you have the teacher reprimand. Don't do that, Johnny. And you see, does he stop? And then when the teacher ignores again, does he go back to hitting, you know? And then you provide attention and does it stop? And essentially, that's what we're doing with a functional analysis for all these different situations. Now, if the behavior occurs across all of those different situations, um, that might suggest that it's automatic. If, no matter what you're doing, even when you leave the child alone, they're still engaging in that behavior. Maybe it's something within the child that's um, evoking and maintaining that behavior over time. But that is really the minority. By and large, challenging behavior is social. It's happening for social reasons. By social, I mean it gets a response from the environment. This is just a recap. We went through these different functions of behavior. So we're, that's the overview of the function-based assessment. Now we're getting into the function-based interventions, so our matched treatments. If it's an attention function, or if your indirect or direct assessment suggests it's an attention function, what you want to do is you want to make sure that it's really about the ratio of the amount of attention that that child is getting for appropriate behavior versus problem behavior. So when parents are busy, they have a tendency to try to get stuff done until the kids are having problem behavior and then they attend. And that's exactly the opposite ratio we want. We want them providing attention upfront and then minimizing the attention for problem behavior. And now we're not saying um, to parents, you have to ignore your child when they're hitting their head on the floor. No, by no means, right? Um, but it's about maybe being neutral in your blocking, keeping the child safe in a very neutral way. Whereas in comparison to when the child's being appropriate, it's undivided, high quality attention, you know, at least more than they're doing at baseline. Also, during behavior, decreasing the extent to which you're talking about, talking about it. Um, even in my ABA clinics and in my ABA school, I see therapists, um, they get stressed when a child is having problem behavior, and I completely understand that. It's extremely stressful. And so they're just talking to the child continuously, or they're prompting continuously. That's a lot of attention, if there's any attention-seeking component to the behavior. Okay? And then um, we want to teach appropriate ways to get attention and provide really positive attention for that. A little cartoon, burping example. Okay. It's pretty interesting attention that you get sometimes for problem behavior. So if you think it's a tangible function, um, then you want to be providing access to those items and activities before the problem behavior or in response to requests for them but not in response to the problem behavior. So calming activities. This can be really tricky. Sending the kiddo to the sensory room to go calm down, where they get to swing or do the slide, things like that. Those might be preferred activities. You know, it sounds pretty pleasant, to me anyway. So those kinds of things can actually, if they're being done after a problem behavior, they're, we're providing it in the wrong way. We should still be giving access to what they want, but before problem behavior happens. 
So you've seen these kinds of things before. This is a very visual way to get a child to communicate. We know that communication difficulties are key to autism, and so picture cues are especially helpful with that population, and you can use pictures to help them communicate. If you think it's an escape function, if it's related to not liking a particular situation or a particular work task, the biggest thing is to start small, back up, right? <laughs> and then work up gradually, which is what we call demand fading. You want to really gradually increase demand so you're not sending them into a situation they're likely to have problem behavior and then likely to reinforce it because you're not going to be able to keep that demand in place. Um, you want to be really careful about timeout. This is the go-to in schools and in homes, but if a child's engaging in the behavior to get out of something, it's going to make it worse. Okay. Um, and then you want to be working on them, um, doing maybe a little bit of work, and then requesting access to something they want next, something that positive reinforcer. You want to kind of combine getting out of something bad with also doing something better. So right, I mean, how ironic is that? If you hate school, you have problem behavior in school, and then you get out of school. It's likely a reinforced behavior, OK? <laughs> Automatic. This is the one that really um, gets tricky sometimes. So the behavior is reinforcing in and of itself. So let's say we've done our functional analysis. This behavior is happening across all situations. And um, it seems to be that the input on the skin maybe is reinforcing. So the first thing you want to do is see what else will that child engage in that might be preferred. What else can they do with their hands or with their mouth that might be fun and preferred? Is it just that when they get bored, they do this? You know, So we just need to enrich their environment at large. And if that doesn't work, you, can, you might need to engage in response blocking. So you might need to find some way to interrupt that behavior from happening. Because each time the child is engaging in it, it's reinforcing it. So find things that, are, that they can request and that they can access that are appropriate, that compete, essentially, with that problem behavior and um, minimizing access to the problem behavior. But the truth is, especially with older individuals, these functions can interact over time and change even. So a fun an FBA done a year ago might not be valid anymore, right? Especially if you use one of the less valid measures from the start. These things vary, they change over time. But in general, providing really clear expectations up front can be extremely helpful because there's, there, that minimizes the need to engage in problem behavior to get out of bad situations, right? Because you know what to expect. That decreases the aversiveness of it. Communication, this is a behavior that generalizes, that increases and grows over time. So this is the most preventative thing you can give to a child, is helping them communicate. 